students. I love this one. Well done, ladies. Great. Thanks. So they're the champion list makers. Okay. So things you need to be. Goodness me, it's exhausting. Commitment, committed, discipline, motivational, inspiration, guidance, mentor, patience, empathy, subject knowledge, caring, confident, accessibility, career building, lucid and simplicity, cultural values, human face, positive, role model, no ego, universal, I can't say that, universality, unbiased, open-minded, flexible, and good communicator. Whew, that's a lot of attributes that you've got to demonstrate. And we're not finished. Okay. Caring, understanding, motivating, supportive, encouraging, liberal, committed, empathetic, kindness, knowledgeable, honest, up-to-date, friendly, adaptable, role model. Are you exhausted? I am. Imagine being a teacher who has to do all of those things. But many do. Yeah? Many of our teachers do. And this is what we need to recognize. I think most of yours were on there, yeah? But there are more, so well done. Okay. So I think those key things are important for us to remember. And, and maybe a bit like the picture, to remember that our teachers in higher education are juggling many things. And to be a great teacher, you have to be the best juggler of all, okay? Now, on that note, we're going to have a very quick break. And in the interest of time, so we can get through everything, can I ask you please to try and keep it short, five minute comfort break, grab a cup of tea or coffee, and maybe we can then restart in five minutes. Thank you so much. Next dimension. This was the knowledge. This was the, these groups here, the ideas that you came up with. Let's see if any are the same. You need to know your subject material. Yeah, this is where you might decide that your teachers need to have a master's or a, a PhD qualification before they can teach. Or they may need to just be an experienced professional. They need to know about the appropriate methods for teaching and learning. How do we actually teach? Okay, what's appropriate in this situation? Should it be that we should be taking our students on a field work visit? Or should we be using the laboratory in this situation? What's going to be the best? Or should we be looking at interactive learning in some way? They need to think and know about how students learn. This is about thinking about some students. They may be um, visual learners. They may like to see things. Some may be kinesthetic or tactile learners. They need to do or feel things. And some may be auditory. They may need to just sit and listen. But knowing how students learn and what's the best way for them to, to understand and gain what they need from the learning experience. The use and value of appropriate learning technologies, uh, being able to, to handle that in the modern world is very important. How to evaluate the effectiveness of learning, so how are you going to actually understand whether they have taken in what you've asked them to take in. And the implications of quality assurance and evaluation in your practice. So I think these, there's some, some areas where we had similar ideas with what you put down. And then the final domain is professional values. And this is really, I hope, the kind of being area. And I, I hope that a lot of what you said, you had a very, very long list. And I hope they're condensed into these four, four points that we've got here. So respect for the individual learners and diverse learning communities. So recognizing that not all students are the same and that students learn at different paces, different rates. They also come from different backgrounds and that that background is valuable to the learning experience. To promote participation in higher education and equality of opportunity for learners. So not just focusing on one group of society but maybe recognizing that some students have not had the same opportunities to date but it doesn't mean to say that they can't learn 
They can all learn in different ways and we need to tap in and, and we need to promote their engagement. And to use evidence-informed approaches and outcomes from research and scholarship and CPD in your, learn, in your teaching and in promoting learning. And finally, to acknowledge the wider context in which HE operates, recognizing the implications of professional practice. So thinking about how, as a teacher, do I interact with what's going on in the rest of the university? So things like the internationalization strategy. My teaching contribution can help those learners, for example, if I'm a language teacher, maybe I'm teaching a language that will enable them to go abroad, which helps the university's internationalization strategy. But maybe it's more about something about connecting people in different ways and also thinking about the engagement with industry and what's going to be the future in terms of employability for my students. So really thinking beyond the classroom that I'm in or the learning environment that I'm in. So those are the key four, the key three areas um, that are covered in the framework. And as I said, it's kind of been found to, to work wherever and whatever you're teaching. Now, in some parts of the world, they have, for different reasons, taken these professional standards. And they've decided to change them ever so slightly to meet the needs of their cultural environment. So we are okay with that. We're okay with that adaptation. And I'm going to give you an example of where that has taken place. So are you familiar with New Zealand? And are you familiar with the fact that in New Zealand there is the indigenous population and the non-indigenous population? So the indigenous population is the Maori culture. And the government requires that the Maori culture is part of everything within universities. So that it is considered in curriculum, it is considered in services, it's considered in leadership. All of the areas of the university must consider the impact and involvement of the Maori culture. So one of the universities in New Zealand has taken our standards and they have applied them to the Maori culture. And you can actually find this on the website. Um, it's called Ako Aranui. So this is the name that they have given it in the Maori language. These are the three core areas. You can see that the areas of activity, they've called it He Mahi. I can't pronounce the other two, so I'm not going to try. But those are the three core areas. And then what they've done is in each of the areas of activity and each of the dimension areas, so whether it's values, knowledge or activity, they have given it a Maori flavour. Okay? So the message is the same. The meaning of the dimension is the same. But they have adapted it to fit their culture. Okay? So what we're saying is that we recognize that every country, every state, every university may be slightly different. So these standards, they can be slightly adapted to fit your needs. Your interpretation may be slightly different, but the base level of the professional standard stays the same. Okay. Um, now what we'll also have a look at, I don't know why that's black. Okay, what's going on? Right, okay. Is that as well as having these standards, we have used them as a mechanism to acknowledge good teaching. Okay? So uh, in research, I'll ask you the question now, in research, um, if you want to demonstrate that you're a fantastic researcher, what do you do? Publish. Fantastic, that's the quick answer. Publishing, citations, conferences as well, it's another area I would say. It's very easy when you're a researcher really to get recognition. You get your name on a book or on a paper. 
I'm fantastic, yeah? What about teachers? You, I am sure, have got some fantastic teachers in your institutions. How do they get recognised? They don't publish. They don't, they don't normally, uh, you know, have a citation. They might not even go to conferences. Some of them might, okay? But how do you recognise them? How do you show them that they're doing a good job? And how can they show you that they're doing a good job? So if they come to you, they want a job in your university, how do you know that they are a good teacher? Well, what we have developed is a fellowship programme which provides professional recognition for teachers. And this has now become globally recognized. Um, and recognition, as we've mentioned, is really, really important. And one of the reasons is that it's very, very motivational for staff. So if you have a retention problem with your staff, this could be one way to actually encourage them to feel part of your university and to stay and contribute if they feel acknowledged, if they feel recognised. You know, sometimes it's about money and pay, but often it's not. It's about status and recognition. So this is one way. Now, the fellowship recognises what is excellent teaching, and that's some of the areas that we've talked about already. It aligns to the professional standards, which are now globally recognised. It is recognised, and um, I often now see people uh, at conferences um, making sure that the letters that they can use, what we call the post-nominals, so if you get a fellowship of the Higher Education Academy, you can actually use the letters after your name. So people know, ah, they're a good teacher, they meet the standards, okay? And it opens up global networking opportunities. We have over 107,000 fellows now using this globally. So you become part of that club. You get to have the badge and you get to be part of the club. Okay? And so you can say, you can connect, you can meet with those people. We have online facility for you also to get involved in webinars and Twitter chats and to meet with other people who are passionate about teaching. Now, the fellowship, and I'm sorry again, the, the colours are perhaps not great on here, but the, the fellowship that we offer, uh, we have four categories. And if you look in the books that I've given you, uh, on the next few pages, you're going to see each of these categories explained. But we have an associate fellow category. And this is perfect for someone who is in a position in your university where they are supporting teaching and learning. So to give you an example, maybe somebody working in the library who is helping students learn about how to do research in a library or maybe one of your IT support staff who is showing students how to use the software, or maybe a PhD teaching assistant, somebody new to teaching. The basic associate fellow is a great entry point for them. Fellow is usually for somebody who's engaged in teaching students directly on an everyday basis, so either in a classroom situation or maybe in a laboratory situation. Senior fellow is for staff who are directing and supporting other teachers. So maybe you're a program leader and you're determining the curriculum that other teachers are going to teach. Um, or maybe you're actually in curriculum development team working across the university. Principal fellow would be for our vice chancellors and for our deans and our leaders who are influencing teaching and learning policy across the institution or even beyond the institution, maybe nationally or globally. So that would be the category that they would apply for. Now, in each of these categories, they have to demonstrate different areas. Again, my colours are not great on here. So starting from the left, you've got associate fellow, and they need to de demonstrate two areas of activity, so not all of the areas of activity. 
The fellow, which is the next one over, must demonstrate all of the dimensions of activity. And the next is the senior fellows, where they have to show how what they do has impacted on others. So other staff, how have they done that? And finally, the strategic leader would apply for the principal fellow and they have to show their impact beyond their world. And they do this in a written application. So usually it's a reflection on practice. You do not need to demonstrate qualifications. You just need to talk about your teaching experience and your career experience relating to teaching and learning. You also need to show two references that are going to support what you say and how you meet the professional standards. Now moving on, if we look at how you can do it, you can either have a direct application, you can go to the Advance HE website, you can apply directly. There is a fee and it's different according to the category, um, but it's a lifetime fee, so you only pay once. It's not every year, it's only once. And that covers the cost of the administration for processing your application and assessing your application. <laughs> if your first application is not successful, you can have another submission again after some feedback and revision. Okay, so you get to try twice before you have to pay again. The other route is if your university has a program for faculty development in your institution already. Maybe there is a scheme where new teachers come into the university and during their first six months they have to undertake some training in teaching skills development. We can accredit that program and at the end if you are successful with the accreditation you can automatically award fellowship to them. Okay. Um, so if anybody is interested in that, I'm happy to have a conversation after uh, directly with you about that. Um, I mentioned the 107,000 fellows. Um, now globally, you can see the spread of associate fellows up to principal fellows. Now the majority you'll see are fellows, people that are engaged in teaching every day. But interestingly, internationally, the biggest growth area at the moment is senior fellows and principal fellows. So that's where we're seeing the most uh, uptick at the moment. Okay. Now this is all very well and you know great. So what, what difference does this really make to me in terms of being in uh, an institution? What's it going to do for me? So I think the best thing to do is to give you a real example of that. And maybe, Joe, can you help me with the video, if that's okay? Um, so I'm going to introduce a university that we actually work with in Australia. Um, so the university is called Queensland University of Technology. Maybe you've heard of it. It's quite a new university. It's quite a big university located in Brisbane, Australia. And for the next 10 minutes, we're just going to hear what fellowship and the professional standards framework has done for their university. Are you okay? QUT has always cared deeply about the quality of learning and teaching. And that's never been more important than in a time when the world is changing so dramatically. We have invested heavily in the quality of our teaching and the quality of our educational programs. And when we came across the Professional Standards Framework and the Higher Education Academy's Fellowship Scheme, to us it was absolutely clear and strategic that we should invest in that scheme. We chose the Professional Standards Framework because it's just that. It's a standards framework that is increasingly global in its reach and its application. We saw the value of being part of an international fellowship scheme rather than a national one. And we really liked the way that the scheme allowed people to find recognition, whether they were very early in their career or whether they were in a leadership role um, at the university. 
We really liked the professional standards framework because it was a scheme that was international in its reach, and increasingly international in its reach, and because it really created a place for people to find recognition whether they were very early in their career or whether they were more experienced leader, whether their role was in teaching or in support for learning. And that's a critically important aspect as we move into new ways of thinking about designing and delivering education. We have been struck by the really enthusiastic way that staff across QT have engaged with the fellowship scheme, not just in terms of individuals applying for fellowship, but perhaps even more importantly, individuals' willingness to become mentors and coaches and assessors and reviewers, to become part of a really active community across the university, across disciplines, across faculties, across layers and levels of experience that has become a really energising and positive thing for this university and for our students. I'm a current student and I'm also aware of the HEA programs. I can see whether my unit coordinator or lecturer have been through the process. It gives me more confidence in their abilities when they've been through the program because I can see that they're continuing to develop and learn. I don't always get a choice whether they've been through the program, but I'm always happy when they have been through. The Academy was formed three years ago and is the key structure through which QUT promotes and endorses our fellowship scheme. We now have more than 500 fellows at QUT across all categories of fellowship from principal fellow through to associate fellow. And our engagement with the professional standards framework has been central to our promoting an institution where learning and teaching is deeply valued and seen as central to student success. The professional standards framework has become an important document that's been fully aligned at QUT with our promotion policy, our evaluation strategy and our professional development more broadly. We've worked with students, academics, professional staff, sessional academic staff and other stakeholders including our leadership structures at the institution to ensure that people can understand the common language of the professional standards framework and understand how important it is in promoting not just teaching excellence but teaching effectiveness across all our areas of work. We've used the professional standards framework as a form of common language to think about the areas of activity, the core knowledges and the professional values that underpin our strategies around learning and teaching. This has really been quite exciting and has certainly created some new collaborative relationships with partners in China, many of which are leading not only to new opportunities to work together on learning and teaching projects, but are also learning to research collaborations. Working with Advance HE and the Fellowship Scheme, we've been able to create key opportunities for staff to develop their practice, to reflect on what's important in terms of having an impact on student learning, and to prioritise new developments and innovations across the institution which focus on promoting student learning and opportunities for staff to develop their capabilities and skills in line with the professional standards framework. I'm a professional staff member here at QUT and I'm also an associate fellow of the HEA. I decided to apply for this a couple of years ago because my work has always been in and around helping academic staff members with what they do. I've worked a lot in curriculum development and data provision across the university. So I saw the fellowship as an opportunity to continue my engagement and involvement with helping others. It also helps me understand when academics are talking about the professional standards framework with the knowledges and the skills because I've also worked through it myself. I have that understanding of the language and the meaning of what's behind it. I found the process of actually doing my application very valuable because in my day-to-day -day work, I don't tend to be particularly reflective of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Normally, it's run from one thing to the next. 
So by having an opportunity to stop and think about why I do what I do and how it impacts on others and can help them do what they need to do, it was a very valuable and worthwhile experience. Uh, my name is Ivana Japlinski and I am currently in a professional uh, position, a learning and teaching strategy development coordinator. I'm also a former academic and at the same time I'm uh, completing my PhD. So actually I am across the research, the academic and the professional positions. I think the application for fellowship with higher education academy had uh, quite um, impressive impact on me because it allowed me to sit down and to summarize my experience and think about my contribution for the future from the three points of view. What does it mean? It means that um, I've already had a quite big experience as an academic, so I could reflect on my past, what I have done. From the research point of view, I could make together, align the research with my academic work and to see that my academic work was uh, research underpinned, actually. But also as a professional staff now, I can see clearly that, that uh, research and academic work are contributing towards the development of the institutional development of the institution, the vision of the, of the university. So it started being together because of the system, you know, the, all the puzzles that started being coming together into one image. Okay, I've done my work as an academic, I've done my research. And in this way, I contributed to the future of the institution. So that was the, actually the structure of the PSF and the questions, requirements of the descriptors, which forced me somehow to think and to address this and to structure my application in this way. And they guided me, actually. So, um, the requirements of presenting the introduction, then saying exactly what I've done, uh, that was my academic role. Uh, justification why I have done this, that was my research on the pink. And finally, what have I learned for the future? It's now, as a strategy coordinator, I can see how this experience can be used in the future. One of the useful things about being a um, senior fellow and going through the process of getting a senior fellowship is the ability to reflect on my practice and the guidance of the professional standards framework gives you to do that. So I felt it was very useful um, that my work was broken down into factions and areas I was able to uh, look in a more focused way um, about how my, my work measures up to, to, to the uh, professional standards framework. Um, and what he's trying to do to help me think about my, um, my practice in a more structured way. Uh, the PSF, I think, has a useful philosophy um, in that it is um, encompassing, it's um, inclusive, um, the language is very easy to understand, and it looks obvious until you start to think about how your practice is able to meet those what are actually quite very, very high standards. One of the most useful things about um, using the PSF, Professional Standards Framework, as a way of looking at your, your practice, is that it provides a commonality of language, um, firstly across the institution, between professional staff and academic staff, um, but also between cultures. So talking to um, colleagues who are working in China, uh, the, uh, the SFA, uh, the UK, uh, there's a commonality of language in terms of the values we apply to our teaching practice and how we hope to improve and develop uh, I'll work in that way. So, as a student, useful tool, and I, I know I've only kept a few copies on the table. You can download this from the website, as I said, and um, I'm very happy to speak to any of you after today, and I know Joe is as well. And um, if you have any questions about what we do and how Advance HE can support you, whether it's in leadership or whether it's in teaching and learning or even in equality and diversity, we're very happy to have those conversations with you. And my final point for today is remember where you started. Remember that you are all artists. And on the wall, 
are your pictures. And I would like to recommend that you take your picture home with you. Maybe take it to your office and put it on your wall because it will be a constant reminder of what makes a good teacher. You said that you drew your idea of a good teacher and sometimes having that visual image reminds us every day of what it means and why it's important. And at the end of the day, everything we do is important because of the contribution we make to students and to society beyond. And on that note, thank you very much to the British Council. Thank you very much to the State Council of Higher Education. And most importantly, thank you very much to each and every one of you uh, for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. B. And we like the way you started from the rural teacher and evolved to your advanced higher education. I also promise that our universities will take the opportunity of professional standard framework which you are offering and I'm sure we will reach the international reputations. Thank you very much. I thank Ms. Manjula Rao for giving us this opportunity and I also thank all the Vice Chancellors and the participants here and my special thanks to Mr. Joe, Ms. Jo Joffer, who was even helping with Becky Smith here in the second session. And uh, I once again thank all the registrars, participants, and our chairman, our vice chairman, Limba Trigaru, and our chairman, Professor Venkatram Nagaru, for being here and sparing the whole day with us in spite of their very important shakings in the office. Thank you all. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, the two sessions, including one more from the Vice Chancellor of MJE, were very interesting. And I think the topics and themes which you covered on, especially the first one, the role of a teacher being a torchbearer, facilitator, reformer, and regarding the accountability of faculty, especially the concept of VUCA, that means volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. Uh, with the advent of internet, it has become much more because the attention span of the students has also come down. If you remember our own class students, when we were students, we could listen to the professor for three hours. Today, hardly 40 to 45 minutes, you can capture the attention of the student. We also talked about academic self-discipline and strategies to overcome the challenges. Professor Altaf Hussain spoke about the higher education challenges, the role of communication skills, the student engagement in particular, reforming the admission and curriculum process, which the State Council has already taken apart upon itself. Coming to the session by Ms. Becky Smith, she stressed the need to challenge for challenging traditional thinking, to start beginning from taking baby steps and then taking it forward and the role of faculty being inspirer, leadership, teaching, service, research, encompassed into the role of a faculty. She spoke about teaching excellence, focus on student satisfaction, realigning teaching with research, and she also spoke about the award mechanism. Uh, in marketing, we say that customers can be classified into gold, silver, platinum, but we also say iron and bronze. Uh, that doesn't mean the iron category is not useful because from iron we do many things. So some of the students who are not non-performers in the classroom can also become outstanding innovators, outstanding uh, uh, scholars in their own discipline, especially the creative field. Dr. Kalam once said, it's no big if you make very bright students extraordinary, but making the ordinary into extraordinary is the challenge. She also spoke about professionalization of teaching, focus on key areas, affecting student success, assessment and feedback, professional development, and of course, uh, making it teaching and research go in the same way. Finally, uh, we all realize today that <coughs> the teaching learning activity 
has moved from a monologue to a dialogue. It has become more interactive, <coughs> practice-based. The student needs empathy. He needs hands-on exposure. He needs uh, documentation of success stories because they do not believe unless you... So there is a concept which we say tell, show, illustrate. So that's what is required. And we are looking at feedback and adaptation and articulation. And finally, uh, it was a very great day, part of the program I could not be there, but the feedback from the many of the participants who are senior administrators is that it has helped them to really sharpen their uh, uh, existing body of knowledge. And uh, I am sure we will be able to take up many more activities, especially on the internationalization of higher education, curriculum development, and also on the policy side. We could learn, learn from the best practices from the UK, and I am sure this Manjula Rao will be constantly giving us uh, kind of a hand holding and we can exchange. Finally, we all have to realize that the faculty is no longer a sage on the stage. Earlier it used to be a sage on the stage. Now it's our role is more to guide the students. It's like guide by the side. So with these words, I thank all the vice chancellors, registrars, principals, council members, members of the media, and of course the staff of the Council of Higher Education. And uh, I think it was a great day. And wish you a safe trip back and look forward to many more occasions. Thank you very much. <coughs>